I wanted to welcome everybody to our um, Middle Eastern Studies um, program, our Masters in Middle Eastern Studies program, otherwise known as MAMES. I'm the Marketing Director at Tel Aviv University International, and we're really happy that you're able to join us to hear more about this wonderful program. I'm going to share my screen with you so that I can introduce our respectful guests. Um, one moment. So, we're here with um, Professor Milet Shamir. She will be um, speaking with you and introducing um, our uh, Tel Aviv University International as the incoming vice president at TAU. Um, in addition to Milet, we have the head of the MAMES programs, Professor Meir Litvak. And he will kind of introduce you to a uh, deep dive into uh, the highlights and the unique points about this program. He's been um, leading it for quite a few years. And um, joining uh, Professor Liefbach, we have uh, Bianca Maria, who is an alum, a recent alum of the program. She's now currently doing our PhD in Italy. And our current student, Anne-Marie, um, originally from France and uh, currently studying with us in Tel Aviv. So um, just to get uh, started, uh, before we begin and before uh, Milet uh, um, uh, jumps in, I wanted to see if we could do a quick round robin um, with everybody introducing themselves, their first name, where you're from, and um, what you studied uh, as your undergraduate and where as your undergraduate degree. So um, I don't see who's in front of me as I have my presentation, but... Um, Feel free to chime in, whoever would like to start. I think that might be me. Uh, this is Ben Warner. I'm originally from New Jersey, currently live in Herzliya, Israel. Uh, I studied uh, Spanish and political science at Occidental College in Los Angeles. Great. Thank you, Ben. Um, how about we go to Eliora? Hi, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Eliora. I'm originally from Maryland. I went to the University of Chicago where I studied uh, philosophy and political science and some Persian. Nice. Um, I think we have Hans Christoph. Yeah, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Hans. I'm from Germany. Um, I've studied uh, business so far in my undergrad and my grad studies and now I'm very happy to join uh, the MAMAS program. Terrific. Um, afterwards, I have Kyle here. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm from Dallas, Texas. Uh, I just finished my undergraduate in journalism, fine arts, and political science. Um, and I'm very excited to come to Tel Aviv. Terrific. Nice to hear. Um, next is uh, Febzi. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Fevz Aldemazola. I'm joining in Turkey. I graduated uh, Catholic University in Italy, International Relations Master uh, Degree Program also. I'm happy to join uh, in this program. Great. Fevzi, I think, did we, co did we connect over email today or was that someone else from Turkey? Because I just wrote with someone in, from Turkey yes, today. Uh, I, yes, yes. Also, I connected today uh, on email. Oh, okay. Okay. Great to have you. Um, and last but not least, I believe it's Anna. I see an Israeli flag behind you, so I'm assuming you're in Israel. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm the current student. <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, sorry, Anna, sorry, we never met. Okay, <laughs> great. So we have um, um, five people joining us, and Milet, I will give you the, I will give you the stage. Hello? Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't hear Milet speaking. Does everyone else hear her? No, no, no. 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 Um, sorry. Can you hear okay. me now? Now yeah. we can hear you perfectly. Oh, great. Nice. So let me start over. <laughs> okay. The uh, tragedies of uh, Zoom uh, meetings, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, 
So I'll just repeat and say that I uh, would like to wel welcome everybody uh, from where I'm sitting right now, which is the beautiful campus of Tel Aviv University. My first order of priorities uh, in speaking to you is to congratulate those of you who are with us today who have already been accepted to the Masters in Middle Eastern Studies uh, here at TAU. Um, congratulations. As you know, Tel Aviv University is one of the most selective institutions in Israel, um, even more so on the graduate level. And so you can feel proud and kind of pat yourselves on the back uh, if you've already been accepted. Um, and we're very much looking forward to seeing you uh, with us next year. Uh, also, I would very much like to welcome those of you who are still thinking about joining the program or applying or just starting to learn um, about our, our MA in Middle Eastern Studies. I hope that the meeting today will be able to convey to you some of the strengths uh, of this program. Um, and mostly, I think, just to answer your questions, any questions you may uh, have as you're thinking about this very important next stage uh, in your education. Um, so let me start by just telling you, and, and Orit, I think you have a slide that, that shows that, yeah. um, that Tel Aviv University is Israel's uh, largest and most diverse institution of higher learning. Uh, we have over 30,000 students um, studying in nine different faculties, very interdisciplinary, very interdisciplinary. We have the sciences, the humanities, the arts, business, medicine, uh, you name it. Um, but within this very large um, institution and within this very uh, broad and diverse university, um, I'd like to tell you that we have a very special niche reserved for our international students and for our international programs. Tel Aviv University and its leadership uh, is currently considering the globalization of our campus as its top priority. And that is part of the reason why we're investing a lot of energy and a lot of care, both in our international programs and in our international students. Um, if, Orit, if you move the slide uh, ahead, uh, everybody would be able to see that uh, Tel Aviv University currently has more than 60 different international programs. And these programs host over 2,000 students uh, who come from all over the world, uh, from the BA level to the postdoc level, from east, west, north, and south. Um, and all these hundreds and thousands of students uh, come to Tel Aviv because they're drawn by the university's uh, academic uh, quality as a top research institution. They're drawn by a campus that is very diverse, as I said, and very dynamic. Um, and also, as I'm sure you know, these students are uh, very often drawn to where Tel Aviv University is located, in the city of Tel Aviv, uh, with its beaches and its restaurants. You know, everybody uh, who comes here uh, falls in love with, with Tel Aviv, and some of you are now in Israel and know what I'm talking about. Um, Oh, wait, I think you have a slide that also uh, introduces uh, to our prospective students, to our future students, uh, the staff that we have uh, at Tau International uh, that includes a team of counselors uh, devoted to the task of uh, making our international students feel at home uh, in Israel, feel at home at Tel Aviv University, uh, taking care of uh, everything from visas and housing to uh, experiencing life in Tel Aviv and in Israel, which we know is a priority for a lot of uh, our students who come from uh, other places uh, in the world. So um, rest assured that as an international student here, you'll be very high on the university's uh, list of priorities. Among the 60 and more programs that we have for international students, the MA program for Middle Eastern Studies has a special standing. Um, and I won't say a lot about that because I know that Professor Litvak is about to tell you about the program and its, its, uh, its um, various aspects and its various strengths. But I will say that I think it's our oldest international program, certainly our oldest master's program, um, with a very uh, long list of uh, former students, uh, a, a network of, uh, of graduates of this program has existed for several decades now and some of our graduates have, have gone on to, uh, to do wonderful things. Maybe May would be able to talk about that um, as well. Um, and 
maybe that's also a kind of a segue for us to think about the role of studying Middle Eastern studies at the present moment. You know, we're living through a very dramatic moment uh, right now and understanding the ramifications of what we're now going through globally on international relations, on areas of conflict, on the Middle East is becoming top priority uh, for many institutions, for many decision makers. And I predict that the impact of our researchers here at Tel Aviv University who deal with Middle Eastern uh, studies uh, is going to be more valuable than ever. And that this is a particularly interesting moment to be joining a program such as, such as this. Um, and, and this is also an opportunity to, to say a few words to you about Tel Aviv University in relation to the COVID-19 um, situation. Uh, one of the things that I'm uh, very proud of is that our university's response to the crisis uh, was quick and it was wide ranging. Uh, the university immediately made itself part of the, the national and the international efforts to fight the virus in various ways. Uh, our faculties of medicine, life sciences and engineering, for example, set up a lab that's capable of performing at least 1000 coronavirus tests each day. And many of our students are volunteering in labs and in hospitals alongside uh, doctors and other healthcare professionals uh, who are faculty members here. Uh, we've established a research platform from, for researchers from different parts of campus to collaborate on writing position papers uh, that would help decision makers in Israel and globally uh, to manage the crisis. Um, and of course, we have a very important team of biomed uh, researchers who are working very diligently in their labs, even as we speak now to develop drugs and, and vaccines uh, against the virus. Um, but in all this, maybe what's most relevant for you guys to know is that uh, Tel Aviv University was committed from day one of the crisis not to disrupt the academic calendar and not to disrupt the academic semester and not to compromise in terms of the, the level of, uh, of learning in our various programs. We were the first university in Israel to transition fully and immediately to online teaching and all our courses continued as scheduled. And it gives me uh, pleasure and satisfaction to tell you that uh, even as we're meeting here today, the campus is beginning to, to come back to life. Uh, we're beginning to hold regular classes again not all classes, uh, only the smaller classes for now, and under very strict uh, safety guidelines, uh, of course. But nevertheless, there's a feeling that uh, the campus is returning to uh, some degree of normalcy these days. And of course, it makes all of us here uh, very, very happy. Uh, now, considering that the beginning of the fall semester is still five months away, uh, since Tel Aviv University doesn't begin the school year until late in October, uh, I feel very optimistic that we would be able to hold all our classes um, as per normal. Of course, nobody can promise anything uh, and no one can guarantee anything in these uh, very uh, difficult times, but um, it looks like it's going in the right direction with that goal um, in, in mind. Uh, but even if we're unable to resume all classes in the classroom, uh, we do have a plan B. We were able to uh, set up a system where you'll be able to begin your studies uh, online with minimal sacrifice of the quality of learning and with no danger to your academic progress uh, in the program. Uh, having said that, I'll repeat again that I'm very much hoping that we will all be able to meet in person uh, in sunny Tel Aviv uh, come October. In the meantime, I wish you all lots of success in your studies and I wish uh, you and your families and your loved ones health and a lot of well-being. Thank you, Milet. Thank you so much. Um, before we jump into uh, uh, Mame's highlights with Professor Liebach, um, I just wanted to make sure that everyone actually had a chance to review the, the slides because there were some technical issues. So as um, Mileta reviewed, um, um, we have 30,000 students and 2,000 international students from 100 and over 100 countries. Um, I apologize if you've already seen this, but I just wanted to make sure that all of it was covered um, visually as well. These are our programs from study abroad to all the way to 
master's as well as PhD. And as she said, we have the student life team here um, on campus to support you on all your needs. So um, making sure that you have the accompanying slides. I also will introduce um, Maureen, who is, Maureen Meyer, who is the director of our uh, Tel Aviv University International. Um, she uh, is here to answer any questions. Um, she's probably the most veteran out of all of us when it comes to Tel Aviv University's uh, international hub. And she will be able to answer any questions when it comes to logistics, arrival, visas, and so forth towards the end of the session. So hi, Maureen, thank you. And um, so, I think it can, we can start now with um, uh, jumping right into uh, the program. Dr. Leitbeck, Professor okay. Leitbeck. Hi. Hi, good afternoon or good evening Israeli time. Uh, welcome to Tel Aviv University. I, I don't think I have much to add to what Milet said about Tel Aviv, but I want to say a few things about, first of all, why study the Middle East right now and why study in our program? And, you know, there's a mythical Chinese curse that may you live in interesting time. In the Middle East, each time is interesting. We always have interesting times. There's a true saying about Israel, never a dull moment. And Israel and the Middle East, we don't have a dull moment anytime. Especially in recent years, the Middle East has been one of the most volatile areas in the world. And if you look at the Middle East, and here if you can move uh, the, some of the slides, basically now, is actually essential to understand the Middle East because of its impact on the entire world. What we have seen in the Middle East in, in recent years is a revolt of the young people. Here, by the way, you see Iranian women demonstrating against the veil, against these old guys here, okay? But this revolt of the young against the old is not only in, in Iran. It is in Egypt, it is in Yemen, it is in Syria, it is everywhere. We have a struggle for social rights, political rights, freedom among young and old people. This is one thing, this is the pleasant side, but we also have struggles uh, between uh, Sunnis and Shi'is, Iran and Arab countries, Iran and Saudi Arabia. Uh, struggles that today have displaced the no largest number of people today that are displaced in the world come from the Middle East. Europe Middle Eastern refugees, may have an impact on Europe if they flood, when they flood Europe or other continents. Another point is not, I mean, it's not only wars, it's also peace and coexistence. Relation between, uh, again, if you, uh, Israel and Arab countries, alliances among Arab countries, alliances between Middle Eastern countries and foreign powers. So what we have here is a multi-texture, multi-dimensional region where you have peace and war, progress and reaction, um, prosperity on some sides and poverty, creativity and destruction at the same time. And the place to study these, all of these things is here in Tel Aviv because our program combines both an in-depth study of the Middle East at, at the present, but with the necessary historical roots because I believe that you cannot understand the present unless you understand the past. Understanding the past is a key to understanding the present. You cannot imagine the power that of the past holds over some of the peoples in the Middle East. And if you want to understand some of the grievances and the pains and the joys of the people in the Middle East, then you have to understand the past, but you also have to understand the future. And I think here what we do at Tel Aviv, at MAMES, is to give you the correct combination of the past and present uh, analysis or tools to understand the present uh, and the past. And as Milet said, if you look at our program, if you look at our graduates, and not only, uh, for instance, uh, Bianca, whom I had the pleasure of being a teacher several years ago, and Anne-Marie, who is one of our most promising students right now, and Bianca is writing a PhD here at Tel Aviv, by the way, okay, after graduating our program. But we have students who have been accepted to top universities ev everywhere in the world, we have students who have become uh, ambassador, uh, foreign ministry officials. By the way, at least three of our Turkish students have been, have been working at the Turkish foreign ministry and they chose to study at our program. But we have uh, uh, also in among our graduates, people who became uh, foreign ministry officials in various countries, journalists, 
research at think tanks. Um, and uh, so I think we offer our graduates uh, the means and the tools that enable them to launch a career in Middle Eastern studies better, I would say, than many, uh, any other institution in Israel and better than many other institutions in, in, in the rest of the world. In addition to that, I think that one of our uh, things that we combine at our program is not only the scholarly side, but in addition to the trips, I would also say the environment, not only of Tel Aviv, but of a program in which I, I, I think one of the proudest things is that our informal nature, okay? This is, we don't this maintain this, this uh, distance between teachers and students, but in fact, we regard our students as future colleagues and therefore uh, being open to our students and being informal to our students, I think is one of our uh, major secrets, uh, uh, now, points of strength. Now, I think I will uh, stop now. So in order to enable you, to give you enough time uh, to uh, ask questions, and especially if you want to ask questions, both Bianca and Anne-Marie to see uh, about their impressions and feelings and attitude toward the MAMES program. And I think, uh, Professor Litvak, do you so want to, go ahead. Uh, sure, are some China? No, go ahead, that's fine. Right, sure. Yeah, so I had a question about um, the uh, Arabic courses. So I know that, um, at least from what I read, they look like they were mostly geared towards um, translation and sort of uh, comprehension of, um, I would say, primary sources. Uh, is there much of a conversational focus on those as well? And if any of the past students could, or current student could speak to that um, and the quality of, I guess, conversational Arabic, if that's relevant. Uh, the it is relevant, but only has limited relevance. And let me explain why. Uh, you need you need uh, what we call literary Arabic in order to understand uh, what people in the Middle East write and talk, by the way, in the most serious media. Sure. Uh, the problem of teaching uh, what you can see spoken Arabic is which spoken Arabic do you teach? Do you teach Palestinian, Syrian, Egyptian, Iraqi, Yemenite, or Moroccan colloquial Arabic? Mm -hmm. Since we cannot offer courses on every uh, distinct dialect, uh, we, it's, uh, we have limited options here. But again, if you want to understand, for instance, uh, ISIS, uh, mm -hmm. and you want to look at ISIS websites, they're all written in, by the way, excellent Arabic. I, I have to say, I don't like the ISIS people, but I love the Arabic. It's, it's wonderful Arabic. It's the most eloquent Arabic you can imagine, okay? <laughs> and again, if you understand, want to understand Arabic, Arabic leaders, Arab leaders, they speak usually in later Arabic. So to, in order to understand politics and uh, uh, also many, again, economics and, and other things, you need the uh, literary Arabic. By the way, once you know literary Arabic, studying colloquial is much easier. The other sure. way around is much more difficult. And sure. therefore, I think, again, we'll give you the basic tools and then from then you can go on. Great, thank you. I don't know if maybe I can add something about like the Arabic just from the personal experience, maybe it can yeah, be useful sure. to someone else, but uh, something to take into consideration. It's not only about, of course, everybody would like to be able to take a course and to be able to speak Arabic and to be fluent in Arabic, but we need to take into consideration the fact that it's like a one year basically program is not never going to be able to cover the amount of studying that you need to know for really learning Arabic. So oh, what I found really useful for myself, and it was wonderful to have the chance to start to learn Arabic during the program and to really put a lot of effort in learning the language and falling in love with the language. And then after the program finished, to just start from where I finished and to continue and to take it to the next level. But this idea of learning at the same time, even if possible, like or even if it was allowed or it was an option to learn together, like the spoken and the literally Arabic, maybe people that I still didn't start to learn the language, they think that it's feasible, but it's much more challenging than what it seems because it's true that it's very similar for many aspects, but there is also a lot of very, very small things that are different. And when you're learning the basis of such a hard language, it can be very confusing. So like 
personally, I really found useful the fact of being studying and focusing a lot on the grammar and really setting a solid base for the learning of the Arabic language, for the literary Arabic. So even now that I pass already to the PhD, I'm still continuing with a very intensive course of literary Arabic and I'm not whatsoever like in a hurry to move on the spoken Arabic because I know it's just going to be the next natural step when I'm going to be able to master the language properly. So. Great, thank you. And if I may ask, what's your PhD? I've been working now like on Libya. The truth is a focus and it's a country that was on my interest since already starting the MAMES. So already during the program I was working in each of the courses I've taken I was trying to find <coughs> the possibility to study and to focus in uh, uh, Libya. And I brought my MA thesis on Libya and it was about uh, the memory of colonialism, the collective memory of Italian colonialism in Libya. And then now with the PhD, I'm continuing, but I'm focusing more on financial and economic institution that were in pre-colonial Libya, Italian and uh, especially financial and economic institution that were not only in Libya, but also in the Ottoman Empire. So that was my, cool. and this is my current focus. Yeah. Thank you. No problem. Um, Bianca, if, if uh, we have you here already, why don't you, um, why don't you share with us uh, a couple of uh, highlights or, or, or key, key, uh, key tools that you came out of with the degree that uh, if you were to, uh, share with the other students. I would be more than happy to. Like something that I think it's amazing about the program is that there were people who like me had already very clear in their mind the path that they wanted to take. So when I started MAMES I knew I really wanted to continue with the PhD and that and MAMES provided me with the tools to go in that direction. But at the same time, there were people that were also <clears throat> already with a very well-defined career path and they wanted just to improve their position in their, in their current work. And there were people that they really didn't know. They were just extremely interested about the Middle East. And I think the program gave to each one of us what we were looking for. So somehow this is an aspect that I think, and I can say because I've done like a first BA and a first MA in Italy, and I studied them also coming more from economics and political science. Uh, it's amazing how the program is really able to fit the different needs of everybody. Like you can really tailor made your program and be able to focus, especially on the country <laughs> and on the aspect that you really are interested in. So for that, for example, as I was saying before, for me it was Libya and I was really able with the help of all the professor to explain and to go further in the understanding of many aspects of Libya and with each one of the courses that I've taken I was studying on like one part of the history, one specific part of the economic of Libya, of the past, of the present and I think this is something that not every MA is able to give you. Some are very very I wouldn't say strict or fixed but I, I think that the flexibility is something very important and also, this is like probably the main thing, like if now we were having and we were taking an MA course on Middle Eastern studies somewhere else, we were going like to write the papers and to write our bibliography and our sources and to write the names down about professor that when you are actually in MAMES program, they're right in front of you. They are the people <laughs> teaching you. Like you're not just writing a name saying, oh, wow, that book is interesting. No, that's right. The professor in front of you, he wrote it. <laughs> like you're quoting him or her. And so what can I say other than you're really, <laughs> you're understanding very fast that you're learning from the very best people. So I couldn't recommend it enough. Thank you. Anna, would you like to um, add anything to what Bianca has been saying, or does anyone else have any qu other questions for Bianca or Anna? Well, maybe I can just add a comment to what Bianca said uh, regarding, the, regarding the diversity of the program. So, first of all, we're, in my year, we have students coming from, from of, of countries, 
and of academic backgrounds as well. So the program really caters to, to everyone, as Bianca said. We have, I mean, myself, I studied uh, international politics before, and I always had an interest on the Middle East, but we have students who, who come from scientific backgrounds, who come from the arts, from humanities. So it's really, so the courses really tailor the interests of, every, of, of everyone in our, in our program. Uh, as Bianca said as well, we have, our professors are specialists in, a, in several areas, in several countries as well. Professor Lidvak is specialist of Iran, for instance. We have um, Dr. Friedman, who's more specialized in Gulf countries, especially Saudi Arabia. And it, and it can go on like that. So you will always find somebody, should you be interested in writing a thesis, for instance, or pursuing very specific, specific interests or continuing towards a PhD, you'll always find someone who who will address your your specific interests. And what else did I want to add? I had other comments, but <laughs> it's not. Uh, I'll think of it in a bit. So, or if anyone has any, if anyone has any questions. Great. Um, Professor Lithbaka, do you want to go into a couple of points about career opportunities or furthermore, a few more frequently asked questions uh, on the next slide? Is there something else that you would like to add perhaps also about the INSS uh, track? Yeah, uh, we open a new track next year in cooperation with the INSS. Uh, that there will be three courses that deal with uh, current uh, political strategic issues. Uh, one would be on um, uh, religious movements and terrorism, one on the superpowers in the Middle East, and the third would be on Israel and our world. And the course will be given jointly by our people, the Tel Aviv University faculty and experts of the INSS. This, of course, you can take this track or not. You can take all three courses, one of them, two of them. Uh, the idea is to join the expertise of two different institutions, university, academic, and the most, the most important uh, strategic think tank in Israel uh, to give you a new uh, outlook, a, a new direction of new aspects of, of the Middle East. Uh, those who take three of the three courses will be given a certain certificate by the INSS and priority in internship at the INSS, but I should also mention we have internships at the Lviv University, the Diane Center and also the Iranian Center, uh, which you can do internship and uh, improve your professional skills. And of course, it always good, looks good on your CV when you apply later for work, for employment or uh, other studies. Great. Anyone have any other questions concerning the program or we can jump over to um, no, no, maybe I'm, I, I'm just gonna make a final remark about what Professor Litwick just said about the opportunity to like do an internship while you're attending your MA degree. Uh, I don't know if it might look like something minor, but it's not. Like it's really something important. And I see it and right now during the PhD that I'm actually working in the Moshe Dayan Center, for example, and I'm collaborating with a lot of interns all the time, that there are either people that are coming only for summer programs or people that are currently studying at the MAMES. And it's an incredible chance. Not many students are given the chance while still being master students to have the possibility to write, to publish, to edit. So it's an incredible chance for me to do it now that I'm doing a PhD and it's already the next level. So think about doing it while you're already studying your, for your MA. It's a plus that uh, for me, but I think for everybody and it's easy to understand why it's really a major addition to the program. So think about it carefully. <laughs> Great. Um, I actually have a question, maybe if you could uh, tell us something in general um, about the average class size, about how many people are choosing the voluntary thesis track afterwards, how many people choose the language courses, um, stuff like that. Thank you. 
it uh, truly varies from year to year. Uh, we have some years that, uh, well, the average class in past few years has been around 10 plus 15, less than 10, depending on the classes. Uh, um, PhD, uh, last year we had five students who continued for uh, uh, writing thesis out of uh, six, 15. Uh, we had again, it, it varies from year to year and it's very difficult to say. There's no, uh, no rule here, no law here about, uh, uh, because it depends on the students, I mean, what they want to do later. I mean, they, can, they want to pursue uh, the more the academic field, then usually they write their MA thesis. If they want to do something more professional, then some of them skip it. So I, I really cannot give you precise numbers. But uh, what, it, what we can, what we insist on, however, is that you can uh, decide to go on the uh, thesis track only after the first semester, only after crossing a certain threshold of grades. That is, uh, that we want to make sure that you can write an MA thesis and you will write a good one and not, uh, uh, so not, not to, let's say, punish you unnecessarily in working on a, on a thesis which will come out bad. And uh, therefore, we want to make sure that students are actually able to write an MA thesis. If they are, if they want, then the door is open and we do our best to help them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And regarding the um, language courses, how many people are on average doing that, those? Uh, Again, I, it, if you want to write an, a thesis, you must take Arabic. Okay, so those who plan to do a thesis usually, I mean, take Arabic in the beginning. I would say about half the people take Arabic. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. mm, I wanted to add something uh, regarding Hebrew. I don't know if some of you might be interesting, might be interested. So in studying it. So it is not a part of uh, of the program. It is a it's a separate ulpan at the university. You can I did it only during the first semester, but basically what happens is that you have to sit a written test at the beginning if you have studied Hebrew previously. If not, obviously you'll join the complete beginners level. If not, you'll be placed in in a certain level, uh, ranking Alifred Gimel, etc., according to your current level of um, of Hebrew, uh, the class I don't I can't remember how many we were, but between ten and fifteen, I would say as well. It's not more than it's not going to be more than that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, maybe if I can add also something about like uh, if you're curious about the number of people that are going to sit in each of the classes like if the question is uh, i have to expect like big classes like undergrad with 60 100 students take all the basic courses it is not we're talking about an ma courses like very small classes and with also a relationship with the professor that it's really i wouldn't say one to one but you know if you have a group of eight ten people 15 maximum uh you will be asked to have a direct participation in the class. You're not gonna, just going to sit and listen to the professor. You're going to be very active and it's going to be very much more like of a dialogue, dialogue and an interactive kind of classes. It doesn't matter for which one, if it's the language courses or whatever other class you're attending. So this is also something to take into consideration. But I would say it's a major plus. Mm -hmm. I want to add again as well, uh, following what you were saying, Bianca, some of, uh, so we have a, a mix between compulsory classes and, uh, and options from which to choose. So there's a very wide range, range as well. So that hence the, probably that, that can explain as well the, the small numbers in the classes, but you will never be more than, I mean, you will never sit in a huge, uh, uh, how do you call it? Uh, amphitheater sitting you will never sit in a room with hundreds of people following lectures um oh yeah 
don't know if that was me or sorry no no i was just trying to jump to a, a another slide while you were speaking go ahead oh sorry uh yes yeah, so i was saying so we're always a fairly small number in the classes which is a huge huge advantage if we're all invited to speak in classes participate openly there's always a especially i mean this year as professor litvak was saying we're facing plenty of interesting events in terms of current affairs uh, we've been and it's very interesting to have discussions regarding events which we always we always closely follow current affairs and discuss them whenever it's possible. For, in, for instance, uh, the death of uh, Qasem Soleimani when he was killed, we, we had quite an interesting talk about that in class. We're always given great, great insights about whatever happens, so that is a, a huge plus as well. And. Uh, um, could you could either of you talk about the the, the types of trips that are um, embedded into the curriculum off campus um, that are integral to the curriculum? I mean, I can't say much because this year, of course, yeah. unfortunately, uh, we haven't had the chance to to experience much of it as it should have normally been. Uh, we had only we had one play, one trip so we planned to the city of uh, Ramle, which um, which is a great which which is uh, now a modern city but always has also sorry has ruins of the Umayyad period so it is very interesting and some crusader sites as well uh, a very lively shuk <laughs> so it's very interest it's a very interesting place to see. I believe we were talking about trips to the city of Haifa to experience the life, um, which is a, a very cosmopolitan city, which which has a mix of um, of British Israelis and Arab Israelis. So you get to see that. And normally, I believe that if I remember correctly, there's always a trip organized during the period of uh, Ramadan, which was a, which should have taken place at the moment. <laughs> to, to, to an Arab place in the north to see how how the minorities of Israel live as well, but I hope that uh, everything will go back to normal very quickly, mm -hmm. so that you get to enjoy the all of you get to enjoy the full extent of what the program has to offer. Yeah, listen, for sure, I think like uh, once you're all gonna be here in Israel, you're not gonna miss any chance to travel all over around the country. It's a rather small country and I cannot recommend enough but to really travel as much as possible and see all the diversity that there is in it. So I think that the chance to take uh, these trips together, not only with your classmates, that it's, it's actually becoming a very interesting experience to share all together and to build some strong connection, like that it's really nice. But really, it's a way to show you maybe some deeper insights about the Israeli society and about how diversified it is. Is everyone back? I saw that we yeah. got disconnected. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I don't know when I went, uh, when, at what point I was cutting what I was saying, but yeah, I think it's just a, a good chance to take and uh, really uh, to go and to see and to have the chance to meet also like people it doesn't matter if it's the um uh, like i remember we took a, the famous trip to the north like at the end of ramadan for the breaking of ramadan and to be like really in the kitchen of an arab lady eating with the family and just she's just telling you all the stories about her work about her family about her children and you know it can be the head <laughs> of the mosque here in yafo like people that for sure, if you were on your own, you would not be able to meet. And the stories and the experiences that they can tell you, uh, I don't have to tell you, of course, they're incredible. And I think it's a must for whoever can to attend all the trips and to really take out the maximum of these experiences. They're really worth it. Thank 
Thank you, Bianca. Um, does anyone else have any other questions for, for, um, for either our students, for Professor Litvak, or for Maureen, our director of the school itself? Um, whether it's living in Tel Aviv, coming to Israel, um, logistics. Has anyone, has anyone ever been to Tel Aviv or, um, and or Israel from this group? Yes. Yep, <laughs> I live here. <laughs> okay, Ben, yes, okay. Right. Actually, wait, I, I do have a quick question. Uh, when is the expected start date of the program? I know sometime in October, right? Professor Litvak, would you like to? Uh, we usually start uh, one week after the after Sukkot. I have to admit, I don't remember the exact date. <laughs> Neither do. Uh, but it's uh, usually, you know, we have to wait until the Jewish holidays because it's, it's no use studying in Israel, studying academic here during the high holidays. You don't get any study done. And this is why we start late, but I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's mid-October this year. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, I, I, I confess my... Uh, failure here. <laughs> right, thank you. We can send you um, a follow-up email with all of the information, including the recording of this webinar, so you can refer back to it. Sure, thank you. Sure. Uh, I have a question regarding accommodation. Um, so I have mentioned online that I would be interested in um, university housing. Um, I haven't heard back anything yet, so I wanted to know um, when will there be any updates? Hi, Hans. Um, did you uh, ask to live in the Broshim dorms? Is that what you asked for? Actually, I'm not really sure about the exact name, but I know that I uh, had the opportunity to mention online um, whether I would be interested in, in um, Tel Aviv University housing or not. And yeah. Sure. So um, I think that within the coming two weeks, you'll hear back from our housing coordinator. Uh, many of the staff were, uh, were out of um, the office these past weeks uh, due to, to Corona, of course. So, so some uh, of those aspects might have taken a little bit more time. Um, but there will also be more time for uh, applicants to confirm um, housing this year due to the situation. So um, you'll have plenty of time to confirm if that's the option you want. And you should hear back uh, within the coming two or three weeks. Great. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, I have a question about of the course credits, all of the lectures. Uh, what is the uh, total credits of the master program? Uh, thanks. I'm, I'm not sure I understand what do you mean, the top credits. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to learn some master program. Is a, I want to learn the uh, uh, total credits. Is a, a, a KTC uh, grades. Uh, how can I say? Some master programs, programs is a 60 uh, total credits. Someone is a 1,020. Uh, I want to know. I want to learn this one. Uh. Um, Fevzi, are you asking how many credits you would need for the graduation yes. of the program? Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. How many credits? Um, Noemi, maybe would you like to take this one? Uh, 36 credits, yes. So, um, yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. And also the year starts on the 17th of October, oh, I so. think. That's, yeah, yeah so. okay. And about the housing, um, I've been told that in June they're going to start mm -hmm. getting in contact with the people, with the students who are looking for dormitories. So I think until June, they're not going to reply yet because I also asked about it. So. Now that I know now how to use the microphone, I... Yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, I have another question regarding the visa. Um, I don't know if you can help me with that. Um, I've seen online that um, right now there's an entry ban for Israel because of Corona. Um, does this only, is this only true for tourists or would this also apply for us as students um, if we want to come to Israel? And um, yeah, do you have any information on that for me? Sure, um, I'll, uh, I'll try to answer this one. Um, currently, the situation is still that um, 
uh, only Israeli citizens or students who are already uh, studying in Israel and have a reason to come back because their studies uh, resumed already are uh, allowed into the country. But what we heard from all the authorities is that within um, a few weeks from now, if the situation continues to improve, uh, which is it is so far, uh, all the regulations are going to be uh, changed again. Um, we assume that even uh, even already for, for July, we'll be able to get more students uh, into the country. Um, so it, it, unless something, <laughs> something changes, it should be absolutely okay. Um, everything is updated on the, of course, on the website of the Ministry of Interior, um, but you can also be in touch with us. Um, again, the minute the courses, regular courses will resume here at Tel Aviv University, students will also be let in uh, to the country. Cool, thanks. Well, we're just under five minutes um, before the uh, end of the session. Any final, final notes? Um, or points to be made, Professor Litvak? The only note I can say is that I truly hope to see all of you on October mm -hmm. 17th here at Tel Aviv, uh, to first day of classes. And thank you. Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Bianca and Anna, for adding so much to this uh, session today. It was wonderful to hear from you. Yeah, and just I want to add my thanks uh, to Bianca and Anna for the great participation. I think it was, the, it was great. It was my pleasure. I just wanted to ask, maybe uh, if the students want, I can leave them my email. I'll, I'll write it down, so if at any given point, if you have questions, then you can contact me and send me an email. I'll be glad if I can help with anything. Perfect. Thank so, you, Anna. Feel yeah. free to just write it up here on the chat, or we can send yeah. it um, in the email after we're following up. So. I'm sending it, yeah, I'm writing it on the chat, so. Thank you. Contact me here. We're gonna add it too. Terrific. Here we go. Terrific. And of course, you have uh, Professor Litvak's email as well as Naomi, the co the program coordinator's uh, details on this page as well. So. Once again, thank you for everyone for joining us, for, for showing interest in this very unique program. And like uh, Dr. Professor Litvak said, we look forward to seeing you in Tel Aviv in October, October 17th to be free Thanks. <laughs> thank you very much. You're thank welcome. You. Thank you very Stay much. safe. Stay safe and healthy. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks for all of the information. You're welcome. Our very, pleasure. You're most welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming. Hey, I'm going to end the meeting unless um, we and we can uh, touch base uh, offline. But thank you again, uh, Bianca and Anna. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you both of you. Thank you very much. You're very Bye. helpful. You've been great. It was a pleasure. Thank Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye.